thank you for joining with us today. If you want to follow along with me in your Bibles, we will be in Genesis chapter 1 as we continue looking at the creation week uh, of God's uh, creation of everything that we have seen. So we started off uh, looking at uh, before Genesis, uh, what things were like before God even started creating. Uh, then we took a look at day one and what God uh, created with the making of light and we looked at kind of some of the uh, nuances of the words that we read in the, the text there to kind of set us up for the following uh, creation events. And then last week we took a step back for a second and looked at that idea of the metaphorical use of light and, and darkness and how that applies uh, into our lives. And so now we're going to jump back into day two. So uh, we're going to look at day two and three uh, today. And if you remember uh, when we started off, we talked about the creation week is kind of in two separate sections. We have uh, God forming like these spheres or these areas that are going to be filled later on. So you have the forming and then you have the filling. And so we're going to finish up on the forming part uh, this week with day two and three as God forms these spheres or these areas that he's going to be filling in the following uh, three days. Uh, so Genesis chapter one, we're going to start off in verse six. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let, let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning, the second day. So he uses this word here of let there be an expanse. And the Hebrew word being translated expanse here means to stretch out. And it had the same idea of stamping metal. And so as you crush the metal, it slowly pushes the, the metal outward and it gets uh, thinner but um, wider. So it's that expanding idea, not so much the thinning idea that the expanse is getting at, but this uh, widening aspect of something. And so this is what God uh, created uh, between these waters that are below and the waters that are above. Now it's pretty simple, almost all of us understand the waters below, what that's referring to. But it's a little bit harder to understand, what is this water above, the waters above? What, what is exactly this expanse? Because this Hebrew word that's being used as expanse is used uh, many different ways throughout the Bible. It can speak of the area of where the birds fly. Uh, it can speak of up into the heavens areas of where the stars and, and the moon are at. Uh, it even is used in terms of a smaller space of the expanse underneath the cherubim's wing. Uh, so it can just signify any kind of, of space. And so it, it makes us curious then of what is this waters above. And sadly, we can't really be dogmatic on it. There's not a lot of great detail that I've ever found that's helped me be able to say, yeah, I'm pretty confident this is what this deals with. There's a great scholarly work um, that point to some some different areas, but uh, all of them kind of admit that we, we really don't know. Uh, and so some would say, boy, the way that the Bible uh, words this, it really seems like it's speaking of the clouds, uh, what we're talking about here. And so he's creating this expanse, and now he has the clouds that are up above. There's some great reasons of why they would say that that is the waters above, but there's also some areas where uh, it doesn't know. It's kind of hard to tell if that actually fits or not. Uh, others would say, well, back uh, before the flood, uh, there was this vapor canopy of water, um, and it's usually referred to as the canopy theory. Uh, so the waters above were kind of above our atmosphere, and it was this kind of protective layer that gave people a longevity of life, kind of made a tropical-like uh, environment. Uh, that's a possibility. Again, that's kind of going outside of Scripture besides this idea of just there's water or... Um, yeah, the waters that are above, uh, they usually use that for a reference of where the water came from for our, the global flood. And, uh, that is a possibility. There's some uh, flaws with that uh, theory as well. And it's not an, a needed mechanism for the flood, but it's a possibility. Uh, another one that's out there, some people say, is something we haven't discovered yet. Uh, that maybe this is waters above that are way beyond anything that we can see. Maybe there are at the stretches of the outer realm of what maybe we would think of, of the universe or, or somewhere out there. 
Um, and there's a hellacious, you know, light years of expanse uh, in between these things. We just maybe, we don't know maybe what it is yet. Maybe it is the cloud realm. Maybe the canopy theory is uh, correct or there's some uh, truth to that. Uh, sadly, we just can't know for sure exactly what these waters above are. It does seem like they're not referring to a canopy uh, theory, at least in this regard, because they are mentioned later in the Psalms after the flood of the waters that are above uh, the waters, whatever. So signifying almost like they are still there, uh, praising the Lord, um, where the canopy method, obviously, we do not see that anymore. So uh, that would allude more to the cloud realm or this uh, waters above, beyond in our universe somewhere that we haven't uh, be able to find yet. Uh, so any of those are a possibility, but that is what God has created. Now those who study uh, ancient writings and cultures would say there's a lot of um, style and wording that's being used here to help signify that God is showing the aspect of creating weather at this point. I can't say that I fully understand all those details, um, but I um, I think very highly of the author and the other works that he's done with ancient culture and how that plays in, and so I'm not willing to throw it out just because I don't understand it. So I can't give you any more detail other than to say there are some that say uh, some of this information does help uh, play out to help ancient cultures understand uh, weather, and sorry that I can't give you any more detail than that because I don't fully uh, understand it. Uh, but maybe you're a little bit further along than I am there, so I want to give that information uh, to you. So now let's move on to day three. Verse nine, and God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. So this is something now that's back to being beneficial to life. So on day two, we didn't really read about anything being good. It was a s starting to set things into motion, but it really wasn't productive in a high-end sense uh, to life, like uh, some uh, like the light and darkness and what we're seeing here with the dry land. So, so God gathers these waters. Remember the, the spirits hovering over the face of the water. Our planet is basically seems to be at the very beginning of creation. This outside watery substance. Um, so he gathers the waters together and has the dry land appear. Uh, now the Hebrew word that's being used as appear has the same idea that we would have in English here of showing something that was already a, in existence. Um, so it wasn't that the whole globe was just this watery glob up in, in space before this, but it did have a core to it and it just that wasn't exposed yet. And so God is exposing the dry land uh, here on day three by gathering the waters all into one place. And so then he, he names it. The dry land he calls earth, and the waters that are gathered together he is calling seas. And he's declaring that this is good that he has made here. Now this idea of gathering water uh, together in one place, um, we've seen this already in the creation account, right? Where he separates light and darkness and he gives them boundaries of how far they can go. Right? Light can't go into darkness because it dispels darkness and darkness can't take over light. There's this divide between the two. And we see the same thing with waters. God is making boundaries for the waters. He, he moves the water so the dry land appears, showing us that the water is under God's control. And this is what amazed the people during uh, Jesus' ministry, right? When there's the, the calming of the storm on the Sea of Galilee, the people are amazed that even the wind and the waters obeyed the word of Jesus Christ. And we see an example of this. Uh, I don't want to overuse uh, God's uh, reprimanding uh, of Job, uh, but we get a lot of theological details about God uh, through that. So we're going to look at that again. In Job chapter 38, verses 8 through 11, God is reprimanding Job again for questioning God and who he is. And so he's posing to Job some questions, and here's one of them that deals with this idea of boundaries for water. God says, Or who shut in the seas with doors when it burst out from the womb, when it made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band? 
and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Now obviously God is using some poetic language here which is very visual for us on talking about when the, the waters burst forth from the womb and uh, seeing the sea doors uh, being opened and being swaddled in this darkness, right? Uh, giving us that imagery of the dark clouds as they roll in before it's going to, to rain. But I love the details he gives about the water on the surface of the ground when he talks about saying, when I told him, thus far you can go and no further. God being able to put limits onto the water. And we see an aspect of this in the third day of creation when he divides the waters out uh, for the dry land to appear. And again, the same thing we looked at last week. If creation has to obey its maker, who are we then who are created in God's image to push against the boundaries that he has made for you and I? Now, day three is an interesting day because it has a second act of creation uh, that happens uh, during it. This isn't the end of, of the third day, and it doesn't say he created dry land or separated the waters and had the dry land appear, and it was evening and morning the third day. No, it goes on to a second act of creation. And this is the first time now that the, the earth is actually going to be uh, productive and what it's doing. So starting in verse 11, and God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. So here, the dry land has appeared, and now God has it sprouting these vegetation, these plants, and these trees. But it's not just that. He says he put within them the ability to reproduce. That they're going to have seeds within them that are going to germinate into the future and produce something that is the same thing that it came from. So they're going to reproduce according to their kind. So you have the acorn that is going to produce an oak tree. And that oak tree is going to produce acorns, which are going to produce oak trees, right? They're going to produce according to their kind. You're not going to get a maple tree out of an acorn. You're not going to get a stalk of corn out of an acorn. Right? Even though the name corn is in there, it just doesn't happen. They're always going to reproduce according to the same kind that they are, the same species uh, that they are. And so God instills that in creation. And we're going to take a look at that here in a little bit on how that applies to you and I and how God uses that imagery. But before we go there, one of the things we said we wanted to do as we look through Genesis is we want to magnify God. We want to expand him out and see interdict intricate details about him and his creation that we maybe wouldn't have seen otherwise if we wouldn't have expanded him, him out. And so I want to do that for a second here when we think of this idea of, of seeds. What is it that God really did? What is it we see of the qualities of God as he produced this vegetation and he put seeds within them? There's great diversity that God made on allowing plants to be able to uh, reproduce according to their kind. Uh, we talked about the, the acorn here. So this uses gravity in order to, um, or uh, an oak tree uses gravity in order to spread its seeds like the acorn. It just falls to the ground. Doesn't seem like it's all that special until you think about well, how does this acorn then turn into an oak tree? Well, it relies on some different methods. It can rely on erosion, and the acorn falls down, and uh, erosion happens and buries the acorn, and so then it's able to germinate. But the vast amount of acorns are actually planted by critters like squirrels that gather these nuts, and they decide to bury them to hide them for winter. Sometimes they'll store them in a... Uh, crotch of a tree or something like that, but sometimes they, they bury them. And the acorn, God has this system working basically on the forgetfulness of, of 
critters like uh, squirrels. So they bury the acorn and they, they forget that they buried it there and they never come back and find it. And so then the acorn is able to germinate. Or maybe something happens to that squirrel and it never comes back to be able to dig it up. Um, so basically it uses God's creation, its critters, to actually go around and plant these guys. If the critter eats it, it does it no good. The acorn is useless then. All it is is, is food for, for the animals. So it must be buried somehow, whether it's erosion or a forgetful animal or something happens to that animal and is no longer able to go and to pick it up. But that is what trees like that that use gravity a lot of times are reliant upon. But then there's other styles, right? We can think of the maple tree that has the little wings onto its seed. Where there are some plants that utilize the wind to, in order to spread their seeds. If it's a heavy seed, it'll have these wings on it that will create this vortex to help it be stable in the air for a while to be able to catch the wind and float away. And if it's on the lighter side of seeds, then it's going to have these little hairs like we'd see on like a dandelion. And they're going to catch the wind in the same way to create this vortex to be able to float uh, through the air. And then we have others that use the rolling mechanism, right? Like a tumbleweed, uh, where the whole plant kind of breaks off as it, it dies, and then the wind catches the plant and, and makes it tumble down uh, across the, the prairie or whatever it might be, and it drops its seeds as it goes along that way. Then there's some that use the aspect of sticking uh, to an animal or a substance in order to spread uh, their seed. So we think of this a lot with burdocks, right? This is the things that can frustrate us when we go uh, walking through the woods and we have all these stick tights stuck to us. But it's exactly what the plant uh, needs for us is to pull them off right. And what do we usually do? We throw them onto the ground. And so it was able to scatter its seeds easier that way. Uh, you have some that use the floating mechanism, right, where it drops its seeds into the water. A lot of water marine kind of plants will utilize this, but also plants that are on land, like the coconut, right? Size doesn't matter when it comes to floating. A coconut is very large, but because of its buoyancy, it is able to float across the water. It may go for, for miles and then end up onto another shore where it can uh, take root and plant itself on there. We have some that are designed to be eaten. Right? These are the ones that we are familiar with, with our fruits and vegetables, where they'll have this uh, substance on the outside of it that will entice uh, critters to eat it. And these seeds, unlike the acorn, will pass through the digestive system and then come back out into another location. So we, uh, well not necessarily we, this doesn't really work with human beings anymore, but an animal, like a deer, comes, eats this, it has traveled away from the plant by now, right? It goes to the bathroom. The seed now passes through the whole digestive system of the deer and is pre-fertilized uh, to be able to grow there in a different location. So the acorn is destroyed when it's eaten, but some seeds will pass through the digestive system in order to be able to uh, be planted into another area. Uh, we have some that we all are probably familiar with, with Out West and things like that. We hear about it. They use immense heat in order to uh, transfer their seeds. So their, their cones will stay uh, tightly held together until like a forest fire or something goes through. And that opens up the bonds of the pine cone in order to spread its, its seeds. And then my favorite one, and I don't know who wouldn't love this method of spreading seeds, but the ballistic uh, style. Uh, where uh, inside the plant something will dehydrate and it will cause something to curl up and basically make like an internal spring. And then the pod opens up and that spring launches uh, the seed out. Uh, another way that the plants will do that is they will actually build up hydraulic pressure with water. And the same thing, the water pressure will shoot it out when the pod opens. Now it's not just about a force uh, that these things use as well. It's amazing how their pods are usually designed in such a way to create a backspin onto these uh, seeds in order to uh, create less of a wind uh, resistance going through the air. So uh, and it's an amazing uh, concept there. I, I remember uh, walking through a very weedy a garden that we had at one of our parks the one time and I thought it was a whole bunch of gnats that were flying around. I'm like trying to bat them all away from my face until I, I recognized it was all these ballistic plants and as I wa walked through it was triggering them to open up and they were shooting their seeds out and it was just this fog like there's a whole bunch of gnats all around me. Uh, so 
uh, then getting down and, and touching each one individually and seeing it shoot out its seed was uh, very entertaining uh, for a guy. And, and then finding those little pieces of dehydrated plant material that look just like little mini springs uh, was neat. So it's a very neat design that God had put into uh, them being able to spread uh, their seeds. Now, some plants, now we talked about these different sides of spreading seeds, but some plants... Uh, exert control over how they dispel their seeds by altering their development according to the environmental conditions that are around them. Uh, so it's an amazing concept that God programmed inside the genetic makeup of some plants to be able to alter how their seeds are going to disperse depending on what the environment is around them. Again, plants don't have a brain. They can't think. They can't process for themselves. But God put information into them to automatically do these types of things depending on what the situation might be at hand. An amazing concept of our God. Now, th this is the thing that I think is so cool when it comes to seeds as well. It's not just the fact of how they're getting dispersed, right? It's they have to grow somewhere. So how does that happen? How is it that a seed doesn't just automatically start growing and kill itself? Like if you throw a seed out um, in November, Many times it won't grow until the spring or something like that. What is, how does that operate? What is going on inside that seed so it can germinate at the right time? And scientists have found that seeds have uh, sensing tissues inside them that can detect the difference in soil temperature and they can read light wave links. Um, so again, an important thing, right? We looked at day one of the importance of light and its uh, vitalness for life. And, Part of the seed is that as well, and that is uh, crucial. So it's recognizing the soil temperature so that plant doesn't start growing in November and kill itself, trying to grow uh, in the middle of winter and being taken out by the snow and, and different things like that. So it's, it's testing when that soil temperature is right. So God has programmed that seed to be when this temperature hits a certain point for so long, you're going to shoot your roots out, and you're going to shoot it in that direction of the soil. And then there's other sensory or uh, things inside that seed that are, are testing the light waves. Well, why is that important? It's not just the duration of how long the sun is out and how uh, much daylight there is, but it's to help that seed know like, hey, I can't get much sunlight right now, and so if I start growing, I'm not going to be able to do photosynthesis because the canopy above me is, is too strong. I'm not getting enough light to be able to grow. But say something happens and a storm comes through and it knocks down one of the trees, that's by that seed. Now all of a sudden that seed is receiving more light waves coming into it. And the seed pops into gear with God's programming to say, I have enough light now. Now's the time for me to start shooting up. And so it starts shooting the roots down into the ground if the soil temperature is right. And it starts shooting the plant up into the air towards those lights. So that way the timing is just right. Now not every seed can last a long time. But a lot of seeds can live many years dormant waiting for those appropriate uh, timings. Uh, that's why it can be so hard for us that we can go and clear a new area or a garden to do seeding and all of a sudden all these weeds come up uh, that we never knew was there. Uh, so sometimes that can be because you know some bird or something like that dropped some seeds in that area but many times it's those seeds were sitting dormant waiting for that thing and when you came and clear cut an area or you pulled out all the other weeds you just brought in new light waves and those that mechanism inside that seed kicked in and said I can get a lot of light right now, now's the time for me uh, to germinate. I think the longest that I, uh, when I was doing a little bit of minor research on this, I think it's 2,000 years old, they had a certain seed uh, that they were they found from an Egyptian like tomb or something like that, I think it was, uh, that they were able to plant and actually have a plant still grow from that. So it's neat that diversity that God has uh, put inside those seeds and to be able to live in a sin-cursed world and to to produce in an environment uh, like that. So again, just shows the, the beauty of God's uh, creation and what he's put into um, his creation. So again, just like we've seen with light, the vast amount of information that there is with the whole electromagnetic spectrum, we, we have the same thing with seeds. God wraps it up by saying, yeah, I, I have seeds that each plant is going to produce according to its own kind. But all this information now as we advance in our scientific knowledge that we find out what's going on with seeds, how they germinate, and all the different ways that they uh, spread. And God just wraps it up by saying, yeah, and I created seeds uh, so things can reproduce. That's just uh, a neat 
uh, what God has, has done. So before we're done, though, today, it's important for us to take a step back. That was magnifying God. Now, what does this mean for us uh, today? And it's important for us to understand that seeds are used as a metaphor for us as well. Uh, that Paul in 1 Corinthians uses this idea of seed to help us understand from what we can observe in God's creation and how that might work out into our lives. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 36 through 38, Paul says this, You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that it is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of weed or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. So let's go back to our illustration of the acorn, right? So God gives this bare kernel, the resemblance of an acorn, but when this goes into the ground, now he talks about the seed dying, and maybe there's an aspect to that, but more than likely the idea that's being portrayed here is the burial process. The seed needs to be covered with soil. So we think of that in the dying process. So it needs to be buried or, or to die. And when this acorn grows, it's not going to pop out of the ground looking like this, right? An oak tree really doesn't resemble a whole lot of an acorn. Uh, you're only going to get an oak tree from an acorn, but it doesn't look the exact same. And Paul is pulling on that analogy for uh, humanity, saying, okay, just like we see with seeds that, yes, they reproduce according to a kind, but they don't look the same. The seed's not the same as the plant. The plant has a different kind of body. He's saying that's the same with our physical bodies as well. We have a body designed for this earth, and that's what we all see. But when it gets buried, when it dies, when it gets buried in the ground, just like we bury a seed, it's going to produce a new body, right? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord if we're a believer, or we wait the time of judgment inside the grave. But everybody's going to have a spiritual um, body, per se, uh, in that point. And that is made for the heavenly realm. So you have the earthly body made for the earthly realm, and the heavenly body made for the heavenly realm. And those are going to be different because they're for different realms. Um, flesh and blood, we're told, cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. We have to have heavenly bodies to go there. So the body that we have that is buried in the ground, just like the seed, is going to produce a different body, but it's not going to be the exact same as what was put into the ground. Right? The oak doesn't look like the acorn. Our spiritual bodies won't be exactly the same as our earthly bodies. There'll be some forms of, of that that's going to be kind of the same. Jesus is the first of the resurrection. It'll be an idea, it seems, that we'll be getting our physical bodies back, so we'll be recognizable in this form, because Jesus was. Uh, but there's that other aspect of parts of that that God, Jesus was different. All right? It seemed to be that he could be traveling through walls. It seemed like he was there all suddenly, sometimes on them. Um, he you know, was able to go into the presence of God. And so those are the things that are going to be different with our bodies. So. That's an idea of what we see, of this analogy of what we know of God's creation with seeds. That's how we can kind of take this to a spiritual level of something we don't fully understand, but we kind of have a representation on this earth of what that might look like. The other one that we have an application for us is the idea of each um, plant bearing seeds to produce according to its kind, of the exact same kind. And this analogy, this metaphor is used to help us understand again another heavenly thing that is a little bit hard to determine. So Paul tells us about this in Galatians chapter 6 verses 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So, we understand if you want to get an oak tree, you have to plant an acorn. If you want corn, you're going to have to plant a kernel of corn, right? If you want a tomato, you have to plant a tomato seed. If you want a tomato, you cannot plant an apple seed, right? It's, it's just not going to work. And that's what Paul is trying to tell us with Galatians here, going, okay, we should understand this. This idea of um, sowing to the flesh, flesh, remember, is 
the part of us that is at war with our spirit. Flesh we can think of with our sin nature. It is our earthly mindset that's kind of that's selfish about ourselves. So it's our sin nature. It's the part we got from Adam that has separated us from God. That's what it's meaning when it talks about our flesh. All right? So to sow to the flesh is to do things that are contrary to what God would want us to do, right? Because that's what sin is. It's in disobedience to God. So if we're sowing to our flesh, we are doing things that are contrary to God. If you're, in contra if you're contrary to God, then obviously bad things are going to come of that, right? And that's why it's saying you're going to reap corruption. So just like we know with seeds, you have to plant what you want. He's saying it's the same with our lives. If we we start doing things that are contrary to God, we're going to reap contrary benefits. Uh, benefits isn't the right term, but outcomes for that. But if we sow to the Spirit, we're going to reap eternal life. If we sow according to the part of us that is connected with God, with what God wants us to do, well, those things are going to have great reward and they're going to last to us through eternity. All right? Think about it if you're planting a garden. You don't want grass, so why would you plant grass seed into your garden? But if you do plant grass seed, it does you no good. There's no fruit from the grass that it, you're going to be able to sustain you into the future. It was maybe just the joy of the moment to plant the seeds. But if you plant uh, a tomato seed into that garden, well then into the future you're going to reap a reward that you're going to be able to utilize the tomatoes, right? And that's kind of how earthly or eternal life kind of works too. We can sow to our flesh here on this earth that's just our personal desires, but they're not going to last very long. It's just for this earth then. And then when we get to heaven, all that stuff burns up and it's of no value. But if we're doing the work of God while on this earth, well then the harvest that we have from that is going to last for eternity. So of course that makes more sense to be going in that route. And so Paul is trying to help us to understand this idea of things producing according to their kind to understand our connection with God. And then lastly, Matthew, uh, Jesus, in the book of Matthew, adds just a little bit more detail to this producing to his kind. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 through 20, Jesus says this, You will rec recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit. But the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So the fruits are the actions, the, the things that we see coming from a person's life. And so he, he starts off with the same thing that we looked in Galatians, but then he adds to it this idea of this healthy tree and these diseased trees. Obviously, the healthy trees are speaking of those who are doing the will of God and serving him. The diseased trees are those who are just self-centered, serving themselves. So we planted a garden this year, and we did some sweet corn. Now the sweet corn has dried up a little bit because it's been so long, but we've had some, some healthy corn that came out uh, that came was good and beneficial for us. But we had a few stalks that were diseased and it produced unhealthy corn. This was not much of value to us and we did not feel like taking part uh, in this. And so what do you think that we would do with this plant? Now obviously corn is a, a one season thing so we don't have to worry about this. But if this was a tree that was producing this kind of fruit, would we want to waste our time our valuable space and our resources allowing that corn to grow? No, we would remove it out and so there was room for the good corn that's producing good fruit. And so God uses that as an analogy to remind us that if people in this world are not doing the will of God, they're like the diseased plant. That they're of no value of, of bringing about what we're created to be, of a royal priesthood, a holy priesthood here on this earth. So they're going to be removed, and they're choosing to do that. That's the difference. The plant doesn't have a choice in that matter. It's just what happened to it. But as human beings, we have a choice of whether we follow God's rules and commands or whether we disobey them. 
And if we choose to disobey them, then God says, you're going to be removed from my presence because you've chosen to be against me. And that's not what we're created for. And so there is that strong warning that God gives. He loves all people. He wants all people to uh, repent and come to salvation into him. But if they so choose not to, uh, they'll have to be removed. And hopefully we can understand that from even a horticulture uh, mindset. That if we were growing fruit trees and we had a diseased one that it was producing no fruit, we wouldn't want that uh, around us either. It's of no uh, value in that sense. We're not saying that the unbeliever doesn't have value as being created in the image of God and being a human being. But we mean in their relationship uh, with God in the aspect of eternity. Uh, they're choosing not to be with him, sadly. So that wraps up our God-formed uh, section of the creation. And now we see that he's going to be filling these areas uh, into the future. And we'll continue looking as we can magnify God uh, through that. Um, but we do want to take that step back and remember that just because we're reading about that creation, that we don't forget what God is uh, using these what we know about creation to speak to us in a spiritual sense. And seeds and uh, creating according to its kind is, is one of those. And so let's go out there uh, this week and continue on into the future, uh, making sure that we are reproducing uh, righteous uh, deeds, things that have eternal value to them, uh, and that we try to help maybe cure some of those diseased uh, plants, to use the metaphor out there, helping people bear good fruit who maybe are doing it in ignorance or maybe those who just haven't accepted Jesus Christ as their uh, Lord and Savior to connect them with God. Uh, so thank you for taking this time to be with us this week and I look forward to connecting with you again.